and welcome. Thank you so much for watching. This show's all about giving you insights and showcasing brands that help you to live your best life and give you confidence. As always, I want to kickstart your morning with some motivational advice to help you to feel inspired and energized to start your day. Today, I want to talk about the importance of appreciating how far you've come. The truth is, when you're ambitious, you constantly feel the need to keep striving. You strive for a better job, the perfect partner, to get that bigger house. But in many cases, when we get those things we long for, over time, we get comfortable, resulting in us feeling dissatisfied again and looking for that next goal to tackle. We keep striving and striving without truly appreciating the journey and hardships that we experienced along the way to get to where we are now. There will always be that next milestone and goal to tackle, but until we become satisfied with the small victories, nothing will ever be good enough for us and feed our satisfaction. When we give ourselves credit on how far we've come and relish in our progress, it makes the journey extra sweet because we enjoy each step of the way. Sometimes we need to stop and smell the roses along the way to our next destination. As the saying goes, remember how far you've come, not just how far you have to go. Stay tuned, coming up after the break. Have you ever been surprised by the success of Netflix? Because it, it's <laughs> been <laughs> massive, right? It was, listen, I'm, you have no, you can't imagine how surprised I am. When we launched this thing, I wasn't thinking at all uh -huh. about what Netflix was going to become. It, it, you would have had me committed if I had said, no, really, one of these days, everyone in the world is going to be using this expression called Netflix and chill. <laughs> what, are you, what are you smoking, Mark? You know, I never saw that coming. Uh -huh. But that's the nature of it. You, you just say it's one step at a time, and sometimes these things just blow you away. Wardrobe provided by H&M. Next up on the show, we have American tech entrepreneur, Mark Randolph. Mark is the co-founder and the first CEO of the media giant, Netflix. Mark, thank you for being on the show today. It's an honor, how are you doing? I'm doing great, well, thanks for having me. I'm looking forward to this. Yeah, I'm, I'm very excited. You have a very interesting journey. I wanna talk about how you started. Of course, everyone knows the media giant, Netflix, but you're a serial entrepreneur and you started at a young age. So talk to us about how your journey to entrepreneurship began. So, you know, it's, it's what the, people do, of course, know Netflix, uh, but I did Netflix when I was 38, and Netflix wow. was my sixth startup. So uh, I've been doing this for a long time, uh, laboring in obscurity, as they say. And in some ways, I'm kind of lucky about that because I think these days, entrepreneurship has kind of been a little over-glorified. You know, there's movies about it, television shows, there's you can major at it in, in school. And in some way, I think that contributes to people doing it for maybe I'll call it the wrong reasons. They think it's all about wealth or parties or being on Shark Tank or something. But, you know, I was really more compelled to do this. I started when I was really young. I was always one of those person, people who saw the world as an imperfect place, but then said, well, how can I fix that? Uh, if this is missing, how can I fill that hole? Uh, and at the beginning, that was always things like starting clubs or launching magazines. Uh, and little by little, uh, it dawned to me, wow, I can actually make a living uh, doing this. And I think that was probably the luckiest thing of all. Yeah. Entrepreneurship is definitely one of those things that I don't think people are prepared for. I'm an entrepreneur and I can tell you that uh, <laughs> I know the struggle. You work 24-7 and, you know... It can be discouraging, it can be exciting, but it's all of those emotions <laughs> all together, you know? So uh, I can it's, completely understand. <laughs> it's really the reason I wrote, that I wanted to write the book because I wanted people to understand what it's really like. That this yeah. is, that, that there, there's this whole, the other thing about um, entrepreneurship is, you know, people are love those epiphany stories about, you know, there's the two guys and they can't make their rent and let's put an air mattress down and then instantaneously you have Airbnb. <laughs> or I can't get a cab on New Year's Eve and then boom, there's Uber. Or even someone's got a late fee in a movie and boom, it's Netflix. But I wanted to show it doesn't work like that. As you said, you work really hard that you really don't see that there is an end possible. That the idea you started with 
you learn as how bad it is almost immediately and you're forced to begin navigating and pivoting and trying things. But you also learn in some perverse way how fun that is. Uh, and I wanted people to see that, that, you know, Netflix, for example, it took us a year and a half just to come up with the business model that actually worked. It was a year and a half of failed experiments, a year and a half of disappointment. Um, yeah. And didn't get to streaming for nine years. Yeah. So these are not overnight successes, but the success is besides the point. There are certainly amazing things along the way. Mm -hmm. I completely agree. And we're going to talk a little bit more about your entrepreneur journey. But I want to talk about something really interesting. Your paternal great great uncles were uh, Sigmund Freud. That's so amazing. Talk to us about that. <laughs> well, it, it's funny because it's not certainly he's a big part of my family. I mean, at home growing up, we have bookshelves full of Freud's books and he has photos on the wall and signed correspondence. But it's not like he played any active role in my life. You know, mm. it's not like Uncle Siggy would like take me aside and go, Mark, you know, this Internet thing, you've got to pay attention. <laughs> I, it was more, I think, this deep cultural acceptance of the fact that how people think about things is as important as the mechanics of it. Mm. That this, not to get to you all psychoanalytically geeky, but that the subconscious does play a big role in decision making. Mm. I mean, another of my relatives was a gentleman named Edward Bernays, where Sigmund was perhaps the father of psychoanalysis. Edward Bernays was the founder of really public relations, mm -hmm. which in some ways is even more directly impactful on this career that I ended up being a part of. Mm -hmm. So, you know, is it nature or nurture? Uh, I'll never know the answer to that one. Yeah. Definitely to be a good entrepreneur, to be successful in anything, your mindset is everything, right? So training your mind to, you know, see the positive in everything and, you know, to get through obstacles, it's, it's definitely something that's really important. I want to talk about in high school and college, you were a mountain guide for the National Outdoor Leadership School. How do you feel that that experience kind of shaped you into who you are today? And what did you learn from that um, experience in your life? I can't possibly overstate the importance. I mean, I'll even go as far as saying that pretty much everything that I've learned about leadership, almost everything that I've done um, as someone who started and run companies, I learned um, with a backpack on. You know, and you have to understand briefly that what Knowles does is it teaches leadership. It's the National Outdoor Leadership School, but it does this in this wilderness setting, and it takes groups of people young people, old people, and sends them out in the mountains for a month. So there I am, this New York kid, all of a sudden in Wyoming, uh, walking off into the woods and not more than a half an hour off the trailhead, the instructors go, okay, we're gonna form into small groups. There's gonna be a leader of the day. Randolph, you're leader of the day. And all of a sudden, you're making decisions. Mm -hmm. You're deciding when do you leave? You decide how fast you hike. You decide when you take a lunch break, how long the break is. Do you go the easier way over the pass, over the, around the, pa the mountain or over the pass? And you find out, I can promise you, how effective your leadership was immediately. Because there's just so few things in life where a 14-year-old, which is how old I was when I first started doing this, um, can make real decisions with real consequences and learn just a few hours later those consequences. And of course, you know, you do that day after day when you're 14. I came back when I was 15. Eventually, as you mentioned, I began working for the school. Um, and over and over, you're doing the exact same things an entrepreneur does. I mean, you're turning to your group. You're communicating with clarity and confidence. Mm -hmm. Here's where we're going even if secretly you're not that clear or confident yourself. <laughs> and that's exactly what you do with a startup. Yeah, that's, that's very true. And you also worked at Cherry Lane Music. And I know you taught yourself um, direct mail and marketing. So talk to us also about that experience and how it kind of led you to the next milestone. Well, you know, I think one of the things, you, the luckiest thing that can happen to you is if you stumble onto something that you really enjoy doing and that hopefully you're pretty good at. And I bumped into that for the first time, you're right, uh, working for this music publishing company where I managed to finagle a job running their mail order division. And don't 
make me sound like I'm important. The mail order division was basically just two sentences in the back of all their songbooks saying for a list of more great songbooks and a self-addressed stamped envelope to so-and-so. And my job was Xeroxing the list of more great Cherry Lang songbooks and sending them out. And, but it spoke to me. And what it was was direct response marketing, where you do things and you get a reaction. And I loved it. And I taught myself everything I could and I experimented and I built that business. And the reason it's important is that when the internet came along, years later, and I had now worked for almost seven or eight years in this direct marketing environment where I had done catalogs, I'd done mail order, I'd done direct response television, and wait for it, I had done magazine subscriptions. Uh, all of a sudden when I saw the internet coming along, I went, oh my gosh, this is direct marketing on steroids. This yeah. e-commerce thing, this is so much more powerful than what I've been doing with catalogs and mail order pieces. And I knew that I wanted to do something in e-commerce. And that really set the stage for a whole different chapter. But it all started just because I was intrigued by uh, sending out Xeroxed copies of more great Cherry Lane songbooks. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah, every experience that you go through definitely leads you to the bigger milestones. Every little thing, small, the small ones, the big ones, they all lead you to your, your next chapter. And speaking of your next chapter, uh, with Netflix, you know, every Netflix is known worldwide. Every, people in every country know about Netflix. So talk to us about what led you to co-create Netflix and what did you do to bring it to consumers, that next level, to make it as popular as it is today? Well, the first thing is uh, it's not like it popped as a moment of inspiration. It, it was what drives you to do most things, which is your old thing is done. Mm -hmm. uh, the company that I had founded was had been purchased by another company, one that was being run uh, had been founded by a guy named Reed Hastings, who plays a big role in the story. Uh, and I said, OK, time to start my next company. This would be number six. Uh, Reed, uh, he was going to be out of a job with this. We, we sold his company. Um, and he didn't want to start another company, but he wanted to be part of something. So uh, we said, what's the idea we're going to do? And it's not like we were saying, it's got to be movies. We're big movie buffs. Not at all. I pitched Reed crazy ideas, nothing to do with movies. I pitched him personalized shampoo. I pitched him custom dog food. <laughs> I pitched him, that, put, put, pitched him that we would do surfboards or created one of a kind using a computer driven milling machine. Wow. And then I pitched him video rental by mail Ooh. and an $8 billion category. And even that, but you got to understand that Reed is tough. Like I'd pitch him these ideas. We'd be in the car commuting back and forth to work and he wouldn't say anything and a minute would go by and then 90 seconds, and then two minutes, but I'm, I'm patient, I'm, I know it's coming. And all of a sudden, he'd turn and go, that'll never work. And oh, then wow. he'd lay into it. Here's all the reasons, here's the logic, and then I would say, oh, no, you're wrong. I've done my research. Here is why it's gonna work. Mm -hmm. And we'd beat these ideas around. And one of them was video rental by mail. Uh, and that one didn't work until we heard about this little thing called the DVD. Thin and light, had movies. Uh, and it made us realize we could perhaps dust off that old video rental by mail idea, which we had discarded a few months ago. And lo and behold, we said, and this is a key startup entrepreneurial mindset thing, rather than working on a business plan or a pitch deck, we turned the car around mid commute and drove back to town and said, let's see if this actually makes any sense. Mm -hmm. And tried to buy a DVD, uh, couldn't find a DVD, it was in test market, so we bought a used music CD and we mailed it to Reed's house in a little pink gift envelope, like a greeting card would come in. Yeah. And the next morning, when he picked me up to drive to work, he had a little envelope with an unbroken CD that had gotten to his house less than 24 hours for the price of a stamp. Wow. And that was, if there was a moment where we went, wow, yeah. uh, this idea just might work, that was probably it. Yeah. And of course, Netflix was not an overnight success. It took a while. So talk to us through that process. And, you know, what kind of challenges did you have to, you know, create this massive billion dollar um, company? Well, listen, the reason that my book and my podcast are both called That Will Never Work is because that is what everybody said when I pitched them this ridiculous idea of doing video rental by mail. And lo and behold, I'm going to show them, oh, darn it, they're right. It didn't work. 
And that's the nature of ideas. They're all bad. Your job as an entrepreneur is to start and realize why your initial idea is bad. And it took us a year and a half, a year and a half of trying one thing after another until we finally actually stumbled on this completely irrational, no due dates, no late fees, subscription model for doing video rental that, surprise, surprise, it worked. So the lesson is a year and a half of struggle, a year and a half of it not working before it finally did. But we did something I think smart, which did set the stage for the Netflix you know today, which is delivers movies via streaming, which is the very beginning realized we can't make this about DVD because eventually they're going to go away. But we can't make it about streaming because that's not here yet. And so we made the company about discovering great stories uh, and began making it real, began doing as much content as we could, began writing an algorithm for predicting taste, began designing this interactive website to put things up that you might like. And that's never changed. And so nine years later, Nine years after we launched, uh, when we finally went into streaming, it wasn't brand new. It wasn't brand new for us, and it wasn't brand new for the customers. It was the same old helping them discover great stories. But now, rather than discovering that great story by mailing them a DVD, we'd stream it to them. And that will still work in, I don't know, 10 years when you're beaming it telepathically into your filling or something like that. <laughs> you know. Through that time, I feel like for every entrepreneur, everyone has that moment where they feel like, am I doing the right thing? Should I give up? Should I do something else? Going back to the drawing board, changing things. Um, did you ever have a moment that you wanted to give up or you thought this wouldn't work? And if so, how did you get through those obstacles and you know, motivating yourself to keep going? So no and yes. In other words, no, there were very few times where I said, I'm going to give up. Um, and yes, there was hundreds of times where you get frustrated that things don't work. Yeah. But there's a mindset thing here. You mentioned earlier the importance of how attitude and mindset is in success. And there's a critical one for when any time you're doing something new, which is you need to fall in love with the problem, not fall in love with your idea. Your idea is going to jilt you. Your idea is going to cheat on you. Your idea is going to run off with your best friend. Your problem will never go away. And when you fall in love with the problem, then even when things don't work, even when your idea doesn't work, it doesn't make a difference. You've learned something new. And Netflix was like that. The problem we were solving, how to find a better way to deliver video content to people, that's never stopped going away. That's still there. Mm -hmm. The mechanisms we've tried, so many of them didn't work. That's fine. We learned something from each of them. And that problem will never go away. We'll still keep striving to do that better and better. And that's, listen, I'm, not, I'm human. Things don't work that I invested time and effort into that I was sure would be the thing that would solve the problem. And they don't work. Ugh. <laughs> but it doesn't take long. Oh, but I got this glimmer. Let's try that next. Yeah. And there I am, right back at it again. Yeah, that, that's the mindset of an entrepreneur, right? You, you <laughs> fail to, you succeed. You can just keep trying and trying and trying <laughs> until and, you finally And win. doing it for the right reasons. Yeah. If you say, I'm doing this because I want to be a gazillionaire, well, you're going to be not only disappointed every single day, you're going to be disappointed because you're not going to, that almost never happens. It's really rare. If you say, God, I love what I'm doing. I love solving these problems. I love sitting around the table with smart people solving really interesting problems. You'll like every day that you go to work, even if you're not changing the world right away. That's very true. It's really about passion because the amount of hours as an entrepreneur and the amount of hardships and failures that you go through, unless you really truly love it in your heart, you're gonna you're gonna stop. So unless you have that fire and that reason why, I definitely agree that you know it's it's about passion and really loving what you do. Have you ever been surprised by the success of Netflix? Because it's, oh. it's been <laughs> massive, right? <laughs> It was, listen, I'm, you, have no, you can't imagine how surprised I am. When we launched this thing, I wasn't thinking at all uh -huh. about what Netflix was going to become. It, it, you would have had me committed if I had said, 
no, really, one of these days, everyone in the world is going to be using this expression called Netflix and chill. <laughs> what, are you, what are you smoking, Mark? You know, I never saw that coming. But uh -huh. that's the nature of it. You, you just say it's one step at a time, and sometimes these things just blow you away. I mean, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm really, really proud of what Netflix has accomplished, and the, the challenge is going... How much was that me? How much was I in the right place at the right time? Um, and that's been a really interesting exercise too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, some some things are destiny, you know. Some it, it's uh, it's written in the cards. Sometimes, you know, you're <laughs> you're at the right place at the right time, and everything kind of leads you to that big moment. You know, your book that will never work: the birth of Netflix um, and the amazing life of an idea. You know, so many people have great ideas brilliant ideas you know I talk to friends and entrepreneurs that have brilliant ideas but they're not able to take that idea and make it into something they're not able to take action they're not able to advertise what does it take to take an idea and make it successful uh, it's an attitude it's uh, and this is gonna sound stupid but you have to start and yeah. I'm not I'm not knocking people who don't it is human nature not to want to make an ass of yourself we don't want to fail. We don't want to make mistakes. We don't want to publicly have something we believe in not work. But you have to get over that in a startup. You, not a startup, any idea. Mm. The reality is, despite what they tell you in the brainstorming meetings where they say, there's no such thing as a bad idea, well, that's bullshit. There's millions of bad ideas. In yeah. fact, almost every idea is a bad idea. <laughs> but if you keep it all safe and warm in your head, where everything goes right and all of a sudden you can just imagine when a million people are you you're never going to find out why it's a bad idea and the trick is if you let it build up into this huge thing it's impossible to try it so what an entrepreneur does which sets them apart what anybody who has an idea that actually does it sets them apart is they start and they start simple and they start now and they go the cleverness is not how good the idea is the cleverness is how can I figure out a quick, cheap, and easy way to try it, to try some piece of it. You don't get anywhere if you don't start. You just yeah. have to take that idea, get it out of your head, figure out a way to collide it with reality, and start that process. Mm -hmm. I, that's so true. You have to start. So many people have these ideas. and. They have more and more ideas and they keep thinking about these things, but they never start or take action on any of the ideas they have, right? There's so many talented people, but not that many people that take action and make it a reality. And then there are people that aren't that talented, but they take action <laughs> and they make it happen. So yeah, you, <laughs> it definitely balances out. But you know, in your opinion, what are three traits that make a successful entrepreneur? Three traits that you think that is really essential to succeed in entrepreneurship? Uh, so the first one is what we just mentioned, which is predisposition to action, which is a fancy way of saying they think less and they do more. We don't, Reed Hastings and I in the car, when we, thought, we heard about the DVD, did not spend six months thinking through all the possible ways. We said, quick, let's go figure out whether we can mail one of these things without them breaking and immediately collided the idea with reality. So predisposition to action. Um, number two is optimism. Um, you have to have some degree of optimism if you're gonna be persistent, if you're gonna keep trying. You have to believe that even though it didn't work this time, or this time, or this time, or the hundredth time, that, yep, I'm gonna get it to work on the hundred and first, first one. And perhaps the more dorky one is you need to have this ability to simultaneously to focus, not simultaneously, to focus. There's a hundred things that are gonna go wrong. There's a hundred things you have to do. You're gonna have the resources to do two of them well. And the challenge is, can I pick the right two? And can I focus in and work on those two, even though the other 98 are all screaming for attention? If I find someone who I see combines those three traits, um, I'm gonna bet on them almost every time. I think that's, that's fantastic advice and you know after your departure from Netflix you became a mentor a motivational speaker among other things what's one piece of advice that you share with your audience um, when you do your motivational speaking and you talk about your experiences with Netflix and other startups uh, mostly what I'm trying to do in all of my mentoring is 
give people a chance to even have a shot at trying this because it's the doing which I find the rewarding part of life. And so it's really easy for me to toss off these really pithy sayings that can be on Instagram or whatever, or Twitter, you know, think less and do more or find the quick, cheap, easy way to collide with reality. But that's not really helpful. So what I'm trying to do when I do a speech, when I try and do when I wrote the book, what I try and do on my podcast is show how to coach people through real life situations about how do you take an idea which you can't imagine doing this without raising money and quitting your day job and saying, no, 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 slow down. Let's figure out something you can do on the side. We can begin that journey of figuring out whether it really is a good idea or not. That's that's the important thing. Start now, start small, um, but start. Uh, it's like learning to speak a language. You don't finish your language classes and immediately get a job at the UN as a simultaneous translator. You get up the courage and you walk into the coffee shop in Paris and you try and order a coffee and mm -hmm. you sound like you're in second grade. Yeah. But you afterwards you go, oh crap, I said the wrong word. But then the next time you get it right and you build on that. And learning to be someone who does take their ideas and make them happen is exactly the same process. Very true. Thank you, Mark, for being on the show today. You have such an epic story, so much knowledge, and congratulations on all your success. It's very inspiring. And we hope to have well, you on the show you. back very soon. No, I'd be, I will be delighted. We've got lots more to explore. <laughs> all right. Thank you so much. Tag TV is available on Roku, Amazon Fire TV, Apple and Android TVs, as well as on Apple and Android phones. Watch us live through YouTube and Facebook.